James chapter 4 at verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth, resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Before I pray, I just want to thank uh, Grant and Aaron this morning, but you men generally, uh, week in and week out, the prayers that you prepare are a blessing to this congregation. So thank you guys. Uh, it's a privilege to just get to preach in light of that. So let's pray once more, and then I will jump into James chapter 4. Father in heaven, thank you for this congregation. Thank you for giving us this time to come together uh, and worship this morning. Uh, thank you for bringing Aaron home safely from San Diego. We pray for our brothers who are uh, brothers and sisters who are down in San Diego, we pray that you keep them safe with uh, this storm coming their way. Uh, help them to be a blessing to their community in any way they can. Uh, and this morning, Lord, as we come before uh, your word in James chapter 4, we pray that you would bless the preaching of your word unto the glory of your name, uh, the edification of uh, your people, and the salvation of those who are far off. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, if you jump into a large river with a strong current, for whatever reason, you're going to have to exert great effort to remain where you are or to swim straight across or to make it any distance upstream. Any of those are going to be a serious challenge. If you enter such a river passively without great intent and ability to do otherwise, you're going to be easily and quickly flowing downstream. Right? Not a hard case to make. And there's a similar reality to this which plays out in each of our hearts. God describes the wickedness of every man's heart in Genesis chapter 6 verse 5. It says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Our hearts, when they're left to themselves, tend in a particular direction. And they tend, James tells us in chapter 4 of his letter, his epistle, toward envy. They tend toward envy. Our hearts tend toward covetousness. They tend toward envy. They tend toward evil continually. And so we should note from the start, this is the way that the world operates. Right? Everybody has this tendency, and apart from Christ, what is the world going to do with this tendency? Well, oftentimes they're going to lean into it. The world operates by means of self-seeking, by means of constant power grabs and manipulation and sinful striving to be elevated above others. The world leans into this tendency toward envy, right? An enraged covetousness, a covetousness which goes beyond wanting the things of others and hating the person that has those things. This is happening in the seats of power in the White House and in Capitol buildings throughout our states, the states in our union, but it's also happening between men in workplaces. It's happening between women at the playgrounds. It's happening between friends in churches. When we take our hands off the steering wheel, our hearts veer toward envy. And so the goal of this morning first is that we each recognize that we're not above what James says here about what our spirits lust toward. None of us are above that. We never want to come to a text of scripture thinking about how helpful it is to somebody else, right? We want to think about ourselves and how it applies to us first and foremost. And so we need to recognize this tendency in each of our own hearts if we're going to hear what James has for us this morning. What God has for us in James's epistle. Envy and covetousness, according to James, 
is not to be understood as some niche sin that a few believers throughout time might struggle with. James says that all of our hearts tend toward this sin. And so although we will all be at potentially different places in our struggle against us and be struggling in different areas of our lives, we must all recognize in us an ability to fall into this temptation. It's something that we each have to actively fight against. But beyond this recognition, James lays out for us what the path of true repentance looks like when we fall in prey to our own pride, our own lack of contentment, our own lack of mercy toward others, our own envy. And what was particular, especially to James's original audience, our desire to bring about the kingdom of God and our own prosperity and peace, which are none of which are bad things, but to bring them about by worldly means, carnal, fleshly means. Right, this section of James's epistle is not a rebuke against these dispersed Christians for their desire for God to vindicate his name against his enemies. That's a good thing. We just sang about that. It's not a rebuke against even their desire for peace and prosperity. Not bad things. It's a rebuke for the way in which these Christians were seeking out their prosperity and their peace. God is not against exaltation. God does not say that the Christians seeking exaltation in their lives are unwise or evil. It doesn't say that. Everyone's seeking to be lifted up in one way or another. It's unavoidable. By one community or by another individual, by somebody, everyone's seeking to be lifted up. But what James wants his hearers, us included, to remember is that God sets the rules of engagement. God tells us the means by which we can seek exaltation. God will not exalt anyone who is seeking to be built up, lifted up in his own pride and in pursuit of his lusts. God's got no time for that. God will only give grace to the humble. He will only exalt the humble. And so we must not only see our own covetousness this morning, which leads to this envy that James is talking about, but we must see the path to exaltation. We must set ourselves to the path which will lead by the grace of God to maturity in Christ. Right, God, we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. That's an objective reality, but also a reality we're growing into. And so you can't, you can't separate our lives as faithful Christians from exaltation. We're seated with Christ in heavenly places. Like it or not, that's the reality. So we just need to understand what that means. Right? The whole, the whole difference is because uh, some of these Christians are hearing that and they're saying, yeah, that's why we're doing what we're doing. But what James's message to them is, well, Jesus is seated in heavenly places. And what did Jesus do? Well, Jesus didn't lord his authority over others. He laid down his life. So that's how he got his exaltation. You're not better than your master. You're to follow in his train. And it's that, it's that counterintuitive idea of what true authority, true responsibility, true leadership, true kingship looks like that James is trying to bring his hearers to. An understanding of what it means to be mature in Christ, what it means to be fit to rule alongside him. Now this first section of James chapter 4 is basically an application, if you haven't picked up on it already, it's basically an application of our text from last week, James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. Last week was more general, more broad, and now James is drilling in, applying that text to his hearers. The end of James 3 was an exhortation, remember, to forsake the wisdom of this world, which is uh, James describes as sensual and devilish. And to pursue, instead of that earthly wisdom, to pursue that wisdom from above, which we talked about being chiefly exemplified in the Lord Jesus Christ. James mentioned at the end of chapter 3 that envying and strife, or self-seeking, envying and self-seeking, lead to confusion and to all kinds of evil. That's the fruit of those things. It's the fruit of envy in the world. But James goes, again, from this broad category in chapter 3 to the specific application in chapter 4. James was not giving some removed and hypothetical teaching on the dangers of envy. No, James is addressing a sin which is already at work, already wreaking havoc, already bringing destruction amongst his audience. He's addressing what they're doing. And so in verse 4 he says, I'm sorry, verse 1 he says, From whence comes come uh, wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? The first question James asks of his audience is this. 
Why do you think you're fighting? Why do you think you're fighting? Where do you seek to put the blame? Is this the inevitable fruit of the persecution that you're under? Is this your only option? Has your current situation driven you to this end of conflict and fighting? James is asking, but he's not really asking. He's really teaching them, reminding them of the truth uh, with these first two questions. The question could be asked another way. Do you believe the problem is fundamentally an internal one or an external one? Is the problem within you or is it all, does it all have to do with external circumstances? The things that are happening to you. From how James will continue his line of rebukes, we're not left guessing. The scriptural answer is plain. The source of our fighting, especially for those whom we ought to be close with, is sin from within, not circumstances from without. The problem is sin from within, not circumstances from without. Our conflicts arise from the lusts that war in our members. And though we will see in the following verses some of the specifics of what was happening in the lives of those to whom James originally wrote this letter, the specific application for them, we must also see the truth of this dynamic in our own lives. The conflicts in your life would not automatically disappear if all of your circumstances were as you desired them to be. Believe it or not. Your marriage would not be free of frustrations and heated disagreements if you had a bigger house. Maybe more places to hide, but not, a, but not an erasing of conflict. Right? Not extra peace. Extra space, but not extra peace. Your struggles in being frustrated as a parent with the needs of those that you're called to care for would not be solved simply by you having more money to spend on toys. More money to spend on fun things to do. Your indulgence in lust would not be solved by you having a different wife. You would not finally be content if you just had that one car that someone else has that's more shiny than your car that works just fine but isn't so shiny. Your self-pity or anxiety would not disappear if you were given this very minute everything you think you think you need to be happy. That job, that spouse, that property, you name it, it will not solve the heart of the conflict in your relationships with others because the problem is internal. The problem is not with external circumstances. The problem is internal. And when I say internal, I do not simply mean personal. It is personal, but it is internal in the sense that it's a matter of desire. It's a matter of affections. It's a matter of the heart. It's not just personal in terms of outward actions. As James will write in the, in the latter half of our text this morning, we need a heart level change, a purified heart, if we're to follow our Lord. Christianity is not fundamentally about uh, ceasing to do one particular list of activities and starting to do this other, more pious list of activities over here. That's not the heart of Christianity. Christianity is fundamentally about a heart-level change. It's a life of faith, a life of trusting Jesus and following what he says is good and right from a heart of faith. This heart of faith will lead not just to a different set of rules to follow, but a fundamentally different way of living. But before discussing that more, James continues by explaining exactly what is happening in this dispersed congregation and then why it's happening. He says in verses 2 and 3, Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Now because, and we, we don't have time to rehearse the entire argument today, but because James's epistle is often understood as having a more general application than pretty much every other epistle in the New Testament, right, which were written to specific churches, and therefore we understand they were addressing specific issues. Well, we've already made the case through our sermon so far that James's epistle actually falls into that category as well, uh, which should make sense. That should click for us in terms of the way that the New Testament was written, why these letters were written. Uh, but because these words are taken as more general, uh, when James talks about killing, it's taken as more hypothetical or metaphorical. Or maybe this is hyperbolic in a sense. Right? There's no way he's addressing actual homicide here. And though we don't have time to rehearse again this entire argument, I've sought to show from the start of our time in James's epistle that he did in fact have a specific audience for his letter who was dealing with specific sins. 
the Apostle James wrote, remember, to the Jewish Christians of the dispersion, those who were forced to flee from the church in Jerusalem. Remember, James, who wrote this letter, was the first pastor over that church. They're forced to flee when Stephen is stoned to death. And we see this ramping up, and we read about it in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 8, this ramping up of persecution. And so the church there is dispersed, that church in which so many were baptized on the day of Pentecost. They're dispersed out. And one of the primary temptations for these Christians to whom James was writing was to fall into the trap of seeking, as we've seen already in James, to see God's righteousness or hit the establishment of his kingdom. When we talk about God's righteousness in James' epistle, we're talking about the establishment of God's kingdom, God's faithfulness to his promises to deliver his people. And their temptation was to see this come about, to seek the building or the furthering of God's kingdom and to do so by the same means by which the Jewish zealots sought to bring about the kingdom, right? Constantly warring with Rome, which just boils up and boils up to the point where Rome just decides to come and decimate them in accordance with Jesus' prophecy. Right? Whether it's the Jewish zealots or the Romans, all of them have the same understanding of building the kingdom. We just go squash everybody else by means of force. That's how you build your kingdom. Right? The temptation for these Christians was to go tit for tat with their unbelieving opponents, the Jewish zealots, responding to their persecution with murderous acts of their own. On top of this overall theme, which James is driving at, in which I think legitimate murder ought to be considered as possible, that makes sense in that context. That's exactly what the zealots were doing to them. The Greek word James uses here is used only two other times to reference killing. It's used only two other times in James's epistle. And that's James 2, verse 11. We've looked at both of these passages already. I'll read them sh- briefly. It's James 2, 11 and James 5, 6. James 2, 11 says, For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, interesting that James would bring that up, says, Thou art become a transgressor of the law. And then James chapter 5, verse 6, this is when James is uh, rebuking the rich uh, that is persecuting uh, those to whom James is writing. He says, Ye have condemned and killed Talking about Christ, he says, Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. In both of these instances, in James 2 and in James 5, the word for kill literally means taking the life of another. This word is used only seven other times throughout the New Testament, all seven referring to physically killing another individual. To understand James is referring to literal murder also makes sense of the trajectory he's laying out in these verses. James's whole point, his whole argument, is that their inward lusts, these inward desires that they have that are evil, that they're giving into, are leading to outward conflicts. Outward fighting, even outward killing. As far as a concept as it might seem to us, right? we think about that today, man, if someone was persecuting our church, I couldn't imagine someone in our church killing them. That seems a little a little over the top. This was very normative in the first century culture among zealots. Right? A zealous community, killing someone from another sect is not, was not an outlandish thing uh, in the least. Conquering by force was what many zealots in Jesus' day awaited. We saw even going through the Gospel of Mark. That's what they awaited and expected from the Messiah. Right? Those in, in Jerusalem who were considered the zealots, right? they were expecting Christ to bring about his kingdom. Right? Are we about to wage war on Rome? Is that what we're doing now? Right? Even though Jesus taught clearly that his kingdom would be established through service, right? him laying down his life rather than domineering authority, these disciples to whom, Jesus, uh, to whom James wrote rather, were still in need of hearing this truth. There's something James' hearers want, James says, that they cannot obtain, either due to a lack of asking God, just straightforwardly not asking God for it, or a lack of asking properly, a lack of asking with proper motives. We're not given specifics as to what James' audience desired and could not obtain. James doesn't tell us point blank. But I think we can make a general but true statement about their desire from the context of James' epistle as a whole. What are they driving towards? What's What's the motivation? What's the thing they're coveting after? Well, from what James has been driving at in his epistle so far, I think the general desire in his audience is clearly centered around uh, obtaining some level of peace and prosperity, an end to the persecution they're suffering, and a defeat of their enemies. Those are the, the straightforward things that I think James's audience desired. And again, in and of themselves, none of these are bad desires. None of these are bad things. James's point is not that these things must be forsaken, but that the way we pursue these things reveals something about the desires of our hearts. From what angle are we approaching these things? From what angle are you approaching 
peace and prosperity. The defeat of your enemies. We can think about how this might play out in our own circumstances. Right? It's good to have a home, as I was mentioning earlier, not marked by constant uh, bickering and quarrels. It's good to have a home not marked by those things. Now, as James, as James says, this is a gift from God, and therefore it's something that you should not expect in your home if you're not asking God to bless you in that way. Right? You may ha- not have that because you're not asking for it. Novel concept. Straightforward, right? You have not because you ask not. That's an easy problem to solve. Right? The only thing that makes that difficult would be your own pride in thinking that you can establish those things on your own apart from the grace of God. If you recognize that God gives that as a good gift, then why would you not be consistent in asking him for it? Right? Peace is a gift from God. We should come to God in prayer on a regular basis, therefore, and ask that such would be the case in our homes. We should ask God for grace to be patient, for a home marked by peace and not by fighting. Right? And don't miss that plain application for your lives this morning, whatever it may be. Right? If you want something, whether a change in your own disposition or a physical thing that would be good, a blessing to you and your family, you need to ask God for it. You need to ask God for it. God's the giver of all good gifts. Do not live with the kind of entitlement that expects daily blessings from God, day in and day out, without asking for them. Ask God for the things you desire. But James goes a further step. James says that you may not have what you ask for, so you did the right thing in asking for it. That's good. James says to do that. But you still may not have what you ask for, right? Praying the right thing in theory, desiring the right thing in theory on some level. But because of the motive of your prayers, the reason that you're asking for them, you still do not receive them. Right? Keeping with the the illustration we're using, right? Are you are you asking for a peaceful home? I've been praying for that for a long time and I don't have it. That seems like a very straightforward thing to be asking for. Why would I not receive peace in my home if I'm praying for peace in my home? Every day I pray for it. Well, are you asking for a peaceful home because you don't want to deal with the issues actually going on between you and your spouse or are you actually uh, be, or do you actually want genuine peace? Cuz those are two completely different things. They might look similar outwardly, but they're two very different things. Right? Because wanting genuine peace, if you're, you know, if you've been married for any period of time and you actually desire genuine peace, you know that that doesn't it's not the same as silence. It's not the same as just not talking. Right? And so if you're praying for genuine peace, that means you're praying with an understanding that this means you know you're gonna have to have conversations where you're going to talk about and have to own and even repent for your own sins. Do you pray for peace in your home knowing that's going to involve confronting the sins of your spouse? That requires long conversation too. And not simply ignoring them to feed into your own laziness or comfort. If you're asking for your home to be marked by peace so that you can feed into your lusts, more time to do the things you want to do, Rest assured that God will not be answering that prayer in the way that you're hoping. He will not do that. God's not stupid. We're not instructed by God in his word to come to him with unchecked desires. The unchecked desires of our hearts. That's not how we pray. Good chance you're going to be praying to consume something upon your own lusts when you do that. Rather, we're instructed to align our hearts with the truth when we go about praying. Psalm 37, which we looked at last week, just reading verse 4 this morning, says, Delight thyself in the Lord. Delight thyself in the Lord, step one, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. A heart which is delighting in God will be a heart which knows what to pray for. If you're asking God to prosper you in your work, you must be consistent and also checking your heart in that desire. Do you want prosperity in your work so that you can live the most comfortable life possible? Or do you desire also to grow in generosity? Is that another desire you have? Do you want to prosper because you have a strong desire, maybe stronger than you're willing to admit, to be seen by the other men of the church as successful and smart, right? put together and disciplined? Is that the driving force of your prayer? Or is it to honor God? When you pray for success and prosperity, do you have some other person in mind to whom you're constantly comparing yourself? Ask yourself that question. 
right? When you're asking for peace and prosperity, is there somebody else who's always coming to mind? A constant person in which, who, with whom you're comparing yourself. Good sign that there's envy right there, right where you're seeing it. In other words, are your eyes set on obeying God and growing in fruitfulness as his child, enjoying his blessings with gratitude, or is God simply a means by which you're trying to compete with others? Recognize that these and many other covetous and envious thoughts can and will drive our prayers if we're not evaluating our hearts. God will not answer our prayers as we would like if the reason we're asking is simply to feed our own entitlements. Because again, God's not stupid. God's not going to be mocked. Nor will he be turned into a vending, mach a vending machine upon which you can consume your lusts. Your fighting, James says, is an effort to get your lusts. Your praying, James says, is an effort to get your lusts. That's what he's telling his audience. This obsession over their covetous desires leads James to a strong rebuke in verse 4. He says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world, the friendship of the world, is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of, of the world is the enemy of God. Friendship with the world is what is fueling the ungodly wanting, which is leading to the external warring. Ungodly wanting leading to this external warring between one another. In other words, how are you seriously going to seek God's blessing? How are you going to seek God's blessing by doing the very things that anger God so straightforwardly? Is God pleased with covetousness? It's a simple question, but a question which must be asked of those who are going to seek God's blessing to further their covetous desires. If that's your desire, what business do you have asking God? That's, that's a time for repentance. That's why James is going to focus on that in the latter half of our text this morning. Now, the adultery James references here is a, it's a spiritual adultery. The Old Testament Israelites are repeatedly called adulterers for their worship of idols, right? their idolatry of gods made with human hands, made with stone and silver and gold. We read elsewhere in the New Testament that covetousness is likewise a form of idolatry. Right? Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, he says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Covetousness is idolatry. Therefore, as we see James arguing, covetousness is a form of spiritual adultery. Right? If the idolatry of the Old Testament can be called spiritual adultery, covetousness is idolatry. And so we see covetousness is spiritual adultery. That's James's argument here. Right? Covetousness is a way of breaking covenant with God, forsaking the bridegroom for an impotent God which cannot save. To pursue this kind of spiritual friendship with the world, James says, is to set yourself up as God's enemy. Right, so you think about that in the context of prayer. You say, you've established yourself as God's enemy, and then you come to him asking for blessing. Just not a, not a good place to be. Right, to have the army of the Lord of hosts consider you an enemy, that's not a position you want to put yourself in. That's a fearful position to find yourself in. And so James continues, he says, Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Do you think it says that to no purpose? This is something you should be aware of. This is the dynamic of your heart. And James wants us to understand that. If we're not operating with that as, a, as something we're aware of, we're going to give way to it. We ought to expect this veering toward envy from our sinful hearts. We must be aware of this tendency, aware of this reality, and therefore be prepared to wage war against it. Hard to fight an enemy you're not aware of. Will we pursue being like our God, who is generous and gives grace to his people, or will we become friends with a world full of fighting and wars and envious murders? Covetousness, which is the kindling in which envy grows, is a, it's a fundamental prohibition that God gives to his people. Right? It's the 10th of the Ten Commandments. We read in Exodus 20, verse 17, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. When you read through the Ten Commandments, this is really the most, especially in uh, the second table of the law, 
So those, those commands 5 through 10, which reference uh, man's relationship to other men, none of them are this in-depth. Interesting. Right? Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Very straightforward. But here we have this long list of things not to covet. I wonder why that is. Covetousness stands out amongst the other commands of the second table of the law because each of the other ten, uh, each of the other on the second half, so five through nine of the commandments, have clear outward manifestations. While covetousness is a matter of the heart, we must also realize that the sin of covetousness, when we think about it, very easily leads into each of the other sins in the second table of the law. But if we were to allow our covetousness to grow over the, go over the goods of your neighbor, for example, you allow your covetousness to grow over the goods of your neighbor, eventually it's going to get to the place where you go and steal something from your neighbor, if you allow it to get to that point. If such covetousness was directed at your neighbor's wife, and you allow that to grow, it's going to grow to adultery. And no, none of us are above that. You allow your sins to grow. You allow your sins to manifest themselves. You give in to them, and they will multiply. We should notice from the prohibitions given to us in the 10th commandment. What we should notice from them is that uh, we're given no grounds for covetousness, no grounds for hateful envy on any front. That's why Moses is so thorough on those, why God is so thorough in giving uh, the 10 commandments to us, why he's so thorough on covetousness. Where can covetous fit, fit into my life? Absolutely nowhere. Not with your neighbor's house, not with his wife, not with his animals, not with uh, his servants, right? And today, just apply that to gadgets and cool things that people have that they like to use and they enjoy and you wish you had. Right? People in this church will have different size houses. You're probably already all aware of that. Some of you will own and some of you will rent. Some of you will have... Lots of land to look at and enjoy and utilize. And some of you won't even have a balcony's worth of outside space that's private. That's your own. But you may not covet your neighbor's house. And you most certainly cannot allow such covetousness to grow into a bitter envying of your brother or sister who has what you want. The same goes for someone else's spouse. The tools and gadgets they have and get to enjoy or anything else. How does he end it? Anything that is thy neighbor's. In case this isn't clear. There's nothing you're allowed to covet. The spirit of wanting, of feeling like we must have something that belongs to someone else or that someone else must be torn down so that we can be built up is far too natural and common for us to ignore. That's James's point here. Do you not? Do you think the scripture says in vain that the spirit in us lusteth to envy? If we ignore it, we will only be robbing ourselves of the opportunity God gives us to put it to death. And this is James's focus in the last few verses of our text this morning. He says in verse six, "But he giveth more grace." Wherefore he saith, "God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble." Now this here is a, a loose quote. That James is giving us from Proverbs chapter 3. But the sentiment of verse 6 is common throughout the scriptures. Proverbs 3 verse 34 says, Surely he scorneth the scorners, but he giveth grace unto the lowly. Similar idea in Psalm 138 verse 6. Though the Lord be high, yet he hath respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth far off. God does not just give us grace. Right? This is of fundamental importance for us. God does not just give us grace on the day that we're saved, on the day that we come to Jesus, and then give us a pat on the back and tell us to do our best. God is far more patient with us. Far more liberal in showing us grace and offering us new mercies every morning. This is not arbitrary liberality on God's part in the way that he liberally shows us grace. But instead, it's the fruit of what was purchased for us in the death of Jesus for our sins. God's not a God who leaves his children after every failure. Right? The people James is writing to, objectively, failing. Not doing great. Right? But what is James, what's James's good news to them? God gives more grace. Right? You guys have all failed this week. We've each failed this week. God gives more grace. But you got to do something with that. You got to do something with that. 
Right? God's not a God who abandons us after every failure. He's the God who instead died the death we deserve so that he could extend to us grace upon grace. So that he truly could give us mercies new every morning. And you've got to walk in that. But this grace is not and has never been for the proud. The proud think they can stand on their own. The proud think they have something, uh, some kind of right to their covetous lusts and to the pursuit of them. The proud, fundamentally, what it comes down to is they're unwilling to submit to God. They're unwilling to submit to God. There's, uh, that is their baseline problem. right? The idea of submission is beneath them. The idea of humbling themselves. And so they refuse to go on a path which demands from the start and throughout the journey that you bow the knee to King Jesus. Not just one day, day in and day out. But for those who see their need for uh, grace from God, James continues with words of life. Right? For some, these would be words, right? We read in, uh, Paul tells us in Corinthians, uh, some hear the good news of the gospel and it's a stench of death unto death for them. Right? So that's what they would hear in verse 7 here. But for, for those who recognize their need for grace from God, we read verse 7, it says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. If you want grace, James says, submit yourself to God. Why, why though? Why submit to God? That's a question we should always ask when we get a, a command. Just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean we, want to, we don't want to understand the why. We want to understand why. Why submit yourself to God? Well, submit yourself to God because God is king. God rules over all and therefore all must submit to him. It's to your great benefit to do so willingly. Eternally so. Additionally, God is the good lawgiver. Why submit to God? God's the good lawgiver. He's the judge, yes, but his law is also good, and it's the way of life. So it's, it's foolishness to not submit to that. It's wisdom to submit to it. Those to whom James wrote were finding it difficult to submit to God's way of bringing about his kingdom. They could not see in it the way of life. Right? They're believing a lie about what's going to bring about life. Finding it difficult to bless their difficult rather to to bless their enemies to wait for God to bring about their destruction, seeking to do it themselves by their own means. Their patience was wearing thin and even running out in some cases, and they were beginning to give into this temptation to throw off submission to God in the name of establishing God's kingdom. Throwing off submission to God in the name of establishing God's kingdom. Satan, whom Jesus describes as a murderer from the beginning in John chapter 8, was the one bringing this murderous temptation to James's hearers. They're responsible for giving into it, but this is the work of the devil, surely. Satan is at times the one bringing the temptations to you to fantasize about having things which belong to someone else. Even temptations to believe slanderous lies about the character of the individual who has the things that you want. But God says to resist him, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Satan does not have the kind of hold that many Christians want to assign to him. He is to be resisted, and we must recognize that God promises that at such resistance, he will flee. The devil has been thrown down. He is currently bound so that he may no longer deceive the nations, which is why the gospel has not just been for the Jews, but has gone out to the world and is multiplying. Satan's power is not completely vanquished, but the prince of the power of the air, as Paul describes him, the strong man, as Jesus talks about in his parable, is bound. He's tied up. Christ is in the process, therefore, keeping with the parable of plundering his property. Right? Taking his own inheritance, those he's purchased by his own blood. Those once following the prince of the power of the air, as Paul says in Ephesians 2. Now they're, now they're being brought in to Christ's fold. As his purchased possession. The fact that we're able to resist Satan, which we are, got to believe that, is a testimony to the victory of Christ in the world. God has took on flesh and he has defeated sin, death, and the devil in our place. Nevertheless, we're told in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8-10, through 10, Be sober, be vigilant, because your advers adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. 
whom, again, listen to this, again, resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the grace, but the God of all grace, who hath called us into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after he had suffered a little while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. When the devil tempts you to forsake submission to God, and instead pursue your lusts, God says, resist the devil, and to do so by reminding yourself of the truths of God's word, which stand true apart from your current emotional situation. Your emotions do not determine truth. The word of God determines truth. And we submit ourselves there even when it doesn't feel right or good. This is the tool we use to fight the spiritual warfare which the devil is seeking to wage against you. Remind yourself of the truths of God's word. God's ways bring life. He will give grace to the humble and the humble will be submissive to God. Right? Not a hard gauge as to whether you're walking in humility. Am I submitting myself to God? This submission is fundamentally opposed to the type of domineering understanding of authority which marked the zealots to whom James wrote. Right? This submission is fundamentally opposed to that of the Jewish apostates. This submission is still fundamentally opposed to the way that many today think about worldly success and exaltation. We live in a world in which most consider it a sign of weakness and impotence to be submitted to someone else at all, especially some kind of uh, completely unchecked, unqualified submission, which is what our submission to God needs to be. Completely unqualified submission. What are you submitted to him in? Everything. Everything. He is Lord. That's seen as weakness and impotence in our day. Stupidity even. Ignorance. But this must be the nature of our submission to God. God requires absolute submission from his people. This is the nature of the kind of humility that James is talking about. Our last three verses for this morning, verses 8 through 10. James says, draw nigh to God. And he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. James continues his exhortation by contrasting the relationship between uh, these believers and the devil, that relationship, and then these believers and God, and that relationship. Right? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. And this is another glorious promise. The term draw nigh here is a translation of the term used in the Old Testament to describe the way that the priests were to draw near to God. Now remember also, we've talked about this already, but think about it in this context. James's epistle was written very early on in the period of the, the New Testament church, right? So they don't have the book of Hebrews to, to tell them the implications of what Christ had accomplished. They didn't have that kind of at least explicit teaching in writing that we know about. We don't know how much they'd heard. But they're hearing this term, right? Think about that to, to these uh, Jewish converts hearing, draw nigh to God. The thing that, the thing that made, made me die in the Old Testament. The thing that I, I risked getting s struck down by the wrath of God, right? Only the priests were to draw nigh to God in the temple. So that's how, they're, that's, that's how you got to picture hearing this. That's been their reality, and that's been the reality for generations as far back as the time when God spoke to Abraham. Right? That's all they know is this idea of you know, draw nigh to God, that's the priest's job. No, he says, draw nigh to God. Draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. Right? For, for the Jews, what was uh, dangerous, deadly even, if you weren't a priest, is actually commanded of the New Testament saint as a way of receiving the blessing of God, which speaks to the weight, the gravity of what Jesus Christ has accomplished for us. Hebrews chapter 10, since we have Hebrews, verses 19 through 22 says, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest, into the holy of holies, the inner part of the temple, where only the high priest could go, not even just the priests. Boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having a an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. 
We have been made priests. Right? This, is, this is the concept, right? We've been made priests through our union with Jesus as our great high priest. We are able to draw near to God through Jesus Christ. Not only are we able, again, James writes, we're commanded to do so. Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. It's not enough to flee from Satan. Right? It's that, like that idea of separating repentance and faith. Right? It's, not enough to, it's not enough to flee from Satan. We must draw nigh to God. In fact, the only way to properly flee from Satan, just like the only way to properly repent, is to turn to God. You cannot flee from Satan in truth without, again, how are we going to arm ourselves? What's going to be the strategy by which we flee Satan? What's going to be reminding ourselves of the truth of God's word? If we're not believing that word, then we're not really drawing nigh to God, and we're not going to be really fleeing from Satan. And so we're to draw nigh to God, calling upon him, resting in his promises. But James is certainly drawing here from Psalm 24. And he's reminding us of what's first needed if we're to draw nigh to God. If we're going to draw nigh to God, what is needed? Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4 says, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Right? Think about our text, right? Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Psalm 24 says, who, sh who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? He that hath clean hands... And a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. James tells us here is to cleanse their hands, these hands which have done evil deeds, and to purify their hearts which have entertained evil thoughts and been double minded in seeking to honor God on the one hand, right? Praying to God on one hand while affirming things that God hates on the other. Again, James is likely drawing from Jesus' teaching on the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Now, if you have even the slightest glimpse, even the slightest glimpse into the reality of your great offense, the great offense which your sins are to God, how far you are from actually being able in any regard, in any capacity, to any measure, to be able to cleanse yourself from your iniquity. And these words might not sound like good news. How am I to cleanse myself? How am I to purify my own heart? But God's command to you here is not to be understood as something you're to do on your own. God's call here certainly is to be washed, to be cleansed, to be purified. But we must remember that God has also provided the means by which we can be purified in heart and have hands that are clean. James tells us to be afflicted, mourn, and weep. To exchange our laughter and our joy for mourning and for heaviness. And all this is tied together. If you want to approach God so that he might draw nigh to you, then you must first be cleansed. And if you're to be cleansed, then you must humble yourself. You must recognize the weight of your sin and not consider it a light thing. Right? If any of that sounds radical to you, To be afflicted, to mourn and to weep, to let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. If any of that sounds extreme to you, what do you think about God? What do you think about his holiness and your sin against him? Does that affect you? Because if it doesn't affect you, then that's going to sound extreme. It doesn't take seeing much of our sin to know what we deserve. Just a glimpse of God's holiness. Your sins against God should pain you. It should pain you because you know it pains God. It should pain you because you recognize that your sin deserves eternal judgment. If you're a Christian, then the penalty of that sin was poured out on Christ. And that should pain you. It should pain you that you caused your Savior such suffering. And that your continued sinning for each of us, it testifies to our lack of gratitude for that great sacrifice. We don't care like we ought. You should mourn your hardness of heart in being so slow to kill the sin in your life. You should be afflicted and even weep over the failures that testify 
right? You're testifying to the truth of God in the way you live your life, for better or for worse. And so when you're sinning publicly, when people in your workplace see your bad attitude, see your sin, witness your gossip, you're saying something about God, you're testifying to who God is when you do that as a Christian. And that should pain you that you represent God that way as we each do in our failures. These are all aspects, and really just touching on, aspects of heartfelt repentance. Our sin is not a light thing, and if we understand that, then we will be sorrowful in our failures. We will feel the heaviness of our sin, and we will bring that heaviness before the throne of God in repentance. This repentance is not only an apology to God for our sins, it's a return to walking in obedience. If you refuse to turn back to the path of walking in obedience, then rest assured, that is false repentance. I don't care how many tears are associated with it. If you refuse to turn back to God's path of righteousness, his path of obedience, walking in his law, what kind of repentance is that? What are you even sorry for? What law do you care about? The fruit of true repentance is not tears. It's renewed faith in Christ and obedience to his commands. This kind of repentance is what it means to humble yourself before the Lord. It's a recognition of the weight of your sin, the punishment it deserves, and a calling upon God who gives you the only hope for forgiveness, the only hope for life, which is found in Christ Jesus alone. From there, this humility again involves a commitment to walking in God's law, walking in obedience, recognizing that he's worthy of your obedience and far wiser than each of us in what is good and right. But we must recognize that our need to mourn, please hear this, our need to mourn, it's a need, our need to mourn and to be heavy in spirit are not ends in themselves. They are not ends in themselves. This is the spirit which we, in which we come to God in humble repentance, right? But what does God promise to the humble? What does God promise to the humble? Well, he promises to lift them up. James tells us. We read in Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. Now, verse 3 to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty. For ashes, the jo- the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. So God gives to the humble. Godly sorrow is good and necessary. I want that weight to sit this morning. Godly sorrow leads to repentance, and re- but repentance leads to renewed life. Repentance leads to renewed life. This is far different. This is my point. This is far different from a man or woman marked by constant sorrow, constant heaviness of spirit. We associate that so often with godliness. To be marked by that constant heaviness is not a sign of godliness. To not have the ability to laugh is not a sign of humility. Rather, if this is the case in your heart, it's far more likely far more likely that you have sin going unconfessed. It's a sign that you are living in the grips of anxiety and that your sorrow is therefore serving as an end in itself. It's not producing the fruit of repentance because that produces restored joy in the Lord. That's that's what repentance produces. It produces renewed joy in the Lord. So if that's not the fruit of your quote-unquote repentance, then what is your repentance? When we truly own our sin and bring it before God, With that true heaviness of spirit, God washes us. God washes us. This is what the blood of Christ does for sinners who call upon his name. Jesus' blood washes us clean from every sin. Jesus' blood removes the guilt and the condemnation of our sins. And we walk away free and cleansed. And this is why we walk away not with an unshakable heaviness, but with the oil of joy in the place of our mourning. Jesus says in Matthew 23, verse 12, And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, 
He that humble himself shall be exalted. Do not seek to be lifted up in the eyes of men, in the eyes of your spouse, in the eyes of your children, in the eyes of your boss at work. Do not play the games of covetousness and envy, which will make your life nothing more than a series of vain competitions, an existence marked by petty striving. Humble yourself before God. James does not say, lift yourself up before God and not before men. He says to humble himself, humble yourself rather, before God. Come before God knowing that you bring nothing to the table but your own sins and failures. Come knowing your righteousness is as filthy rags before him. Come as a, a humble servant, grateful to God for all that he's given you, and therefore willing to joyfully take up whatever task he assigns you, and grateful to receive every good gift he's pleased to give you. Do not be bitter for what God has not given you. Be grateful for what he has given you. Seek the blessing of God, but do so by God's means. Seek the establishment of his kingdom. Seek the prosperity and peace of your family and this church and this community. But do so by God's means. Do not do so out of selfish ambition and with the hope that all praise and honor will one day be due to your name. Do so with a heart of gratitude to God and with a posture of humility before him and therefore before others. This humility will only be cultivated. This humility which James commands of it's only going to be cultivated if you regularly, with a hatred for your own self-righteousness, casting aside your entitlement, your covetous thoughts, all the sins that entangle you, come before God in heartfelt repentance. That's where that humility is cultivated. The answer to your lack of humility is not to settle or to strive for mediocrity. I don't want that for any of you. Right? That's what I, that's what I was talking about earlier when I talked about uh, Christianity not being about just changing the, the things we're doing. Oh, we just need to strive for lesser things and then we'll be more humble. Right? You're kidding yourself. You will find so much to boast about in your striving for mediocrity if, that, if you're doing it by that means. Strive to be great and do so by God's means. Don't seek humility in these outward things, seeking to do lesser things. No. Do what God has called you to do. Seek to be excellent. Humble yourself by repenting of your sins. That's how we humble ourselves. And trust that God will raise up the humble. Come before the throne of God. Pleading the blood of Jesus to be your covering, your source of cleansing and purification. Come singing the praises of God's glorious name and all of his wondrous works. Come before God regularly in the blood of Jesus and he will give you grace. Come with mourning and God will give you joy. Come with heaviness and he will give you garments of praise. He will lift you up as trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we confess to you our pride, uh, our covetous thoughts, our lack of humility. Uh, we pray that you would make us a humble people. Help us to see uh, the glory of your holiness, uh, the weight of our sin, and the uh, abundant mercy which you offer to us in your son, Jesus Christ, who lived the life we ought to have lived but failed to do, who died the death we deserve but have been spared uh, by your grace and through his sacrifice, and who has been risen from the dead, seat now ascended and seated at your right hands, uh, so that we might have new life, and so that we might reign with you, uh, seated with him in heavenly places. Mature us, Lord, uh, that we might be a people uh, forsaking our sin, uh, putting on Christ, uh, walking in humility, that we might be exalted by your grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.